scam. The title for tonight's talk is uh, The Nature of Fear and Insecurity by Bante Kovida from Canada. Bante Kovida of Chinese descent grew up in, on the tropical island of Jamaica, West Indies. He migrated to Canada where he studied science and then traveled overland from Europe to India and Nepal. There he began the study of Indian history and culture, Hatha Yoga, meditation and Buddhism. Bante Kovida took ordination with Venero Balangoda Ananda Maitreya, a noted scholar, teacher, and meditation practitioner. Since then, Bhante has been traveling and teaching the Dhamma in Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Europe, UK, US, and across Canada. He also teaches medi mindfulness meditation and Chico, which are beneficial for mental, emotional stress, anxiety, and depression. Bhante is giving a series of talks at Brickfield's Temple, so you can check the schedule and uh, attend. And also he has a weekend one-day meditation retreats. I think there are four one-day retreats during his day. So we pass on to Bhante Kovida. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I begin, I would like to just test your memory. The last time I was at BGF, but I think it was at the other center, it was 2008. Who can remember that event, 2008? Let's see. Okay. Can you rem remember what we did? Can you remember what we did? Huh? Uh, it was Qigong. <laughs> it was the Qigong. I like to test people's memories. But I know in this warm, humid climate, it's, uh, it can be difficult because you find in a cooler climate, your, your memory tends to be, uh, to be clear, to be more clear. But I find too that when, we, when our minds are always distracted mm, by television and internet and screens and so on, it, that it tends to affect uh, one's memories. Mm. Because as you know, many people now are very addicted to their smartphones. And I can see that very clearly because I don't have one. So I can see. Even while people are having lunch, they just can't, can't let it go, even for 10 minutes. Mm, they're either scrolling while they're eating, or they'll stop eating, pick it up, you know, check, 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 put it down, eat, stop, pick it up. And I really have to laugh to see where humans are evolving. It's quite amazing. Mm. Yes, it's very convenient to have a smartphone, but you find that when, when you, b you become too addicted, it actually uh, it agitates the mind. It makes the mind very agitated. Of course, you don't have to believe me. You can see for yourself. Mm. And I, w I was at a center uh, last year, I think, in Jakarta. And the, the president or the, the leader, she was so addicted to her smartphone and I could see how agitated her mind was. So I said, you know, as president of this center, you have to set an example. Mm, this is a Dharma center. This is not a business, uh, business office. Mm, see how agitated your mind is. Mm. Well, that's the nature of this, uh, this gadget. Mm. So it's really about finding a balance. You know, when you have to use your smartphone, you use it. And when you don't need to use it, you can just put it down. And when you have the, the discipline, you realize that the world is not going to come to an end to, uh, if you don't uh, check your smartphone. But when we're anxious, you know, that compulsion, you feel something is going to go wrong. But that's the nature of anxiety. And of course, fear. 
And I like to explore this topic of fear because as human beings we can all relate to this, uh, this condition. Because we all experience fear, monks included. <laughs> It's a universal uh, affliction. Fear. And also, I would like to uh, say that the speaker is not an authority. So we should be investi investigating together as Dharma friends, as Sangha, together. Because I'm not one of those people who like to pretend that I have the answer for everything. Because I don't. <laughs> because I'm just a human being, and being human, I also have limitations. And, uh, and humans, as humans, we're not perfect, monks included. I say that because sometimes people think that monks should be perfect. So if they show any human qualities, you know, like even anger or irritation or some emotion, you know, they think, oh, this is bad. What kind of monk is this? They think monks should be like a, a Buddha statue, just sitting calm and smiling all the time. But this is, of course, wrong understanding. And one of the things I like to speak about is uh, guilt. Because, again, many people have problem with guilt. And as you may know, it's an aspect of fear. And in North America, where I'm based, a lot of people have this problem. And I'm sure it, it's here, too because it is a unifer universal problem, the problem of guilt. And yes, it is natural to have regret when we make mistakes. You know, regret things we, we said, things we did, and we regret, you know, I shouldn't have done that or I shouldn't have said that. Mm -hmm. Or I should have done this or I should have said that. And sometimes we regret things we didn't do and we didn't, un you know, we should have said or we should have done. That's natural. But if we keep feeling, uh, if we keep regretting and keep feeling guilty, then we end up torturing ourselves. Mm -hmm. We create a lot of dukkha, conflict. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have this. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the judgmental mind. Because as human beings, we are conditioned hmm, to be judgmental, you know, criticizing, comparing, sometimes condemning, labeling, liking, not liking, wanting, not wanting, and of course to have aversion. Sometimes anger, hatred, jealousy, envy, and so on. Hmm? Resentment. And this is where mental defilements come from. That's our condition habit of always reacting. So our brains, our, our brains have been educated, programmed to be always doing this. And it seems like perfectly normal behavior. And that's why everyone has mental defilements. We can't escape it. We are all conditioned this way. You know, labeling, judging, criticizing, comparing, and so on. And even Siddhartha Gautama himself had these mental defilements because he's, he's human. He was human. But, you know, with great effort, he was able to uh, purify his mind. Hmm. And it is this condition this conditioning that gives the, the idea of a permanent self, 
a permanent, separate, independent self, you know, ego center, and we become very attached to this uh, center, mm, this ego or self. And of course, without mindfulness, without investigation, this I seems very, very permanent, doesn't, isn't it? Mm. And the more self-centered you are, of course, you feel more isolated. Mm. You feel more lonely. Mm. You feel more separate, even from your family, even from friends, from society. And of course, you begin to feel separate from nature itself from the world. And that's why one of the fears is the fear of isolation, fear of, os of, of loneliness. Now basically there are two types of fear. Physical fear and mental psychological fear. Now physical fear is is something easier to understand because it's a natural instinct. You know, when you see something dangerous, this, this fear arises, something very natural. And of course, when we were very young, we have to be taught you know, by our parents or elders to be careful, hmm? otherwise you're going to get hurt. Just like young animals are taught, you know, the the dangers, the physical dangers mm, of the environment. And sometimes young animals have to learn by mistakes also. You know, sometimes children don't listen to their parents. And sometimes they have to learn by mistake. They have to get hurt or whatever. And then they learn through pain, through injury. But once you learn physical dangers, then this it becomes instinctual. Whenever you see something dangerous or life-threatening, this uh, physical fear arises. Now, a mental psycho psychological fear is something more complicated because it's really based on thinking. And there are many types of mental psychological fears. And I like to use the model of a tree. You can call it the tree of fear. Mm, the different branches are the different types of mental fears we have. And then you have the connecting trunk of the tree, mm, which are the connecting factors. There are three factors. Mm. That all the fears we have, there are three connecting factors. Like the trunk of the tree, and then you have the root of the tree, the root of fear. So we can just go through some of the types of fears that we experience. <laughs> the one that is based on, you know, the fear of the future. Fear, fear of uncertainty. Because that covers many fears. And we can all relate to that. For example, the fear of not being successful. Mm. The fear of not achieving what you'd like to achieve. The fear of... Um, not getting married and having a family. I should check my list because it's a long list. A fear of not being loved and accepted. And with that is a fear of um, rejection, right? A fear of rejection. Yeah, the fear of not living up to family expectations especially if you get a lot of pressure from, uh, say, your parents. Mm. That adds to the anxiety, doesn't it? Mm. Mm. Fear of not having a, a, a good job. Mm. Mm. We can all relate to that.
then there's a fear of change. The one of the fears we have, the fear of change. The fear of loss, right? Whether it's f uh, family members, close friends, the fear of losing a job, mm, because a job gives you a sense of security, right? The fear of losing certain material things that you're attached to. Mm. Mm, we can relate to that. Then there's a fear of authority. And of course, this fear we can all relate to in Chinese culture, the fear of ghosts and spirits. And one of the meditations that I try to get people to do is to do the, the cemetery meditation. Mm. To use mindfulness to overcome the fear of ghosts and spirits. Mm. I haven't been too successful in Malaysia. But in Singapore it was much better. Mm. But uh, hopefully I'll tell you more about that. And what is interesting is that the fear of ghosts and spirits and the fear of authority, there's some connection. There's some connection. But I won't ask you to find it. <laughs> but once I, once I explained it, then it's obvious. Of course, there's a fear of, um, of sickness, aging, and death. Mm? The fear of the unknown, because you know, death is the great unknown, isn't it? Mm? Fear of death and the unknown. And I find the subject very fascinating because I've been questioning, investigating you know, since uh, a, a teenager. Mm, fear of death and the unknown. And out of that fear, human beings have created so many beliefs in an afterlife. Because mm, it's a great unknown. Mm, so we want to believe that we somehow will continue. You could write a PhD thesis on this. How many different beliefs that humans have created uh, through the many, many centuries. So many different beliefs in an afterlife. And reincarnation and rebirth is just one belief. Believe me, there are many beliefs. But when you investigate, you begin to understand. And it is a fascinating subject. I'm not sure if I'll have time, t because I could actually speak on that one subject just for a whole evening. Mm. Fear of the unknown, and why we want to believe in an afterlife. Fascinating. There's also the fear of public opinion, right? You know that one. You, you know what people are saying or thinking about us. And of course, it doesn't matter how hard you try, you cannot stop people from talking or thinking, right? <laughs> But we have this fear. And for some people, including monastics, there's the fear of not becoming enlightened. <laughs> the fear of not becoming an arahant. Ayo. <laughs> for some monastics, that's a big one. And of course, if you're still attached to ego, you want to be enlightened as soon as possible. Because the ego is never patient. Mm. And that's why one or two teachers attract devotees by speaking about instant enlightenment. Maybe you've heard about some of these teachers. There are two or three who are very well known. Instant enlightenment. It's very attractive, isn't it? Mm. Just like instant coffee, right? Three in one with the sugar. And as we said, fear is also related to guilt. I speak more about guilt. There's also the fear of physical or emotional pain. Hmm? Fear of physical or emotional pain. The fear of loneliness and isolation. The fear of not having a life partner or close friends. Of course, fear of the future and uncertainty. 
yeah, fear of rejection we mentioned. And one of the fears we have is being anxious about the way we look. You know, anxious, worried about our, you know, our image mm, when we look in the mirror. <coughs> You'll be happy to know that the image you see when you look in the mirror is not who you really are. <laughs> And I'm sure you've had this experience here. One day you look in the mirror and you said, yeah, today I'm okay. I'm not too bad. You know, I'll never be a beauty. I'll never win a, a beauty con you know, competition or I'll never be a fashion model, but I'm okay. But then two days later, you look in the mirror and say, ayo, what happened? I look awful. <laughs> I need, you know, more makeup or a different type of makeup or I need cosmetic surgery. I don't know about in Malaysia, but there are some cultures that are very uh, obsessed about, uh, you know, cosmetic surgery. And as soon as they can afford it, that's t top priority. Mm. This obsession with body image. Mm. Mm. But it's a great uh, delusion when you, when, you, when you understand it. Now guilt, I just mentioned, as we said, it is natural to make mistakes, to have regrets. So it's important when we make mistakes, we have to forgive ourselves for being human because we're not perfect. Very important. But again, because of our human conditioning, the judgmental mind, we think we ought to be perfect but it's just a concept, it's just an idea. Because as humans, we're not perfect. No one is perfect, and we all make mistakes. Even famous teachers. <laughs> so you can say it's perfectly natural to make mistakes. And this is why the practice of metta, loving kindness, is so beneficial. Because we replace those negative judgmental thoughts with kind, positive thoughts. Mm. Very beneficial. And f guilt is an aspect of fear because we create negative images of ourselves. You know? Just like when we have conflict with somebody, we create a negative image of that person, right? Or, and our thoughts become very critical, very judgmental. Oh, that person is awful, terrible, blah, blah, blah. You know, they are this, they are that, they are that. So likewise, we create negative images of ourselves. Hmm? I'm so stupid, I'm so bad, I'm so awful, you know, because I did this or I did that. You know, I'm going to, you know, go to hell or burn in hell. And for many Buddhists or Hindus, bad karma. I'm going to have a bad rebirth. I'll be suffering in the, you know, next life. <coughs> and that's, of course, anything negative towards others, towards ourselves, naturally create fear. Mm, that's how it... That's how guilt is related to fear, because of that negativity, you know, the, the image, the negative images. Mm. A lot of people have problem, this problem with guilt. Yeah. And in Western society, because the attachment to self is so strong, they take everything so personally. Mm. In North America, this is a very big conditioning. Everything they take personally even things that are not directly related to them. Somehow they take it personally. It's really a crazy f kind of uh, conditioning. Mm. But again, we're conditioned to be deluded, mm. to be ignorant. Mm. Very strong. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of mindfulness, a lot of investigation. Mm. So basically, all these fears we mentioned about, you know, not being successful, not, you know, achieving this, and all that, 
not being married, having a family, you know, not pleasing or parents, uh, you know, following their expectation. I think the, the two, there are two basic reasons for, for those types of fears. And it ha again, it has to do with family expectations. And also, the habit of comparing yourself. Because again, it's a part of our conditioning, right? When we compare ourselves with others. And it's a very unhealthy, very destructive uh, conditioning that we have. And we don't realize it until we go through the this, this suffering that comes with comparing yourself to another. And maybe you can remember when your parents compared you to your other siblings. And you, can you remember how you felt? You felt so, so awful. Mm. You'll never be as good as your, you know, brother or your older sister. Mm. You feel so you worthless, inferior. Mm. It gives you a sense of inferiority complex. Mm. And that, of course, breeds fear, anxiety. Or your parents compare you to your cousins. Can you remember that? Or even to your neighbor's children. <laughs> And they don't know how destructive it is because it's a part of their conditioning. And parents, because of their own delusions and anxiety, put all this anxiety on you. I can see it in Singapore. So when I'm in Singapore, I'm very outspoken about this. Mm, all these deluded parents. And they put so much pressure on their children and they don't realize how destructive it is. And from their point of view, they think they're doing the right thing. Mm. But they are not. And this is why there's a very old, wise saying. Maybe the, o the older members here might remember that. Saying, it goes, the road to hell is often paved with good intentions. Do you know that saying? Yeah. The road to hell, you know, the road to suffering, is often paved with good intentions. It's a very good saying. Because mm. very often, especially parents, sometimes even your good friends do, because mm. of their own anxiety, their own delusions, you know, they end up cr creating a lot of suffering for other people. But yet from their own standpoint, they think they're doing the right thing. But they're not, because the wisdom is not there. Just fear, anxiety. And in a place like Singapore, it's only when the children have a nervous breakdown and they end up in the hospital, only then these crazy parents realize there's something wrong. And when children jump from high rises, it's too late. But at least if, you know, if they end up in the hospital, there's a chance for them to recover and for the parents to learn from their mistakes. Yes, the road to hell is often paved with good intentions. Mm. Yes, yeah, so fear, anxiety, insecurity, guilt, uh, all these, these uh, mental states are connected, part of dukkha, mm, part of delusion. And also you find that when you compare yourself and you feel inferior, it creates craving. Mm. Or in Dharma language we say becoming, you know, you'd like to be as good or as su successful as that person. Mm. Or you, you'd like to be as attractive or popular. And if you're into fashion, you'd like to, you know, be able to wear, you know, nice clothes like that person. Hong Kong is crazy about this. Mm -hmm. Very often co-workers will compete against each other. Who can outdress each other? Wearing all these expensive brand name items. They're very m crazy about brand name clothes, you know, accessories, handbags, shoes, jewelry, makeup, competing. 
very deluded behavior. And the funny irony is that in the end they all end up looking the same. <laughs> Think about it. Mm. Mm. Human delusion. Because, you know, it's the same fashions, isn't it? Same accessories, same makeup, uh, uh, you know, cosmetics, everything. And they're competing against each other. It's a crazy world. You have to laugh, really. Because if you don't laugh, you just cry. <laughs> so it's better to laugh. <laughs> but again, it's a world of de delusion, isn't it? Ignorance and delusion. Mm. I remember uh, w once I met a student in Malaysia many years ago, because I've been coming here a long time. And this was at a, at a, at a, at a Dhamma camp. And he was a very bright student, not only academically, but he very intelligent. He questioned, a good inquiring mind. And he was, a, you know, always an A student. And he said to me, every time I have to study for an exam, I get this anxiety, this fear. So I said, why? You're an A student. What do you have to be anxious about? He says, I'm not the problem. It's my crazy parents. And both of them are school teachers. He's always been number one, you know, top of the class. He was naturally bright. But the last two years, he came second and third. But with the same high A average. But his parents didn't like that. You know, my son has to be number one all the time. And these are s school teachers, you know, you think they would know better, but no, again, deluded. And so they will always put pressure on them. Y you have to be number one, you've got to study harder, make us proud. Can you imagine that nonsense? That's not love, is it? Or you can say it's conditional love. It's not loving kindness and compassion because it, they're thinking about their ego, isn't it? Their egos. They're not thinking about their son. So I said to him, I really want to speak to your parents and I really want to give them a good scolding. He looked a little anxious. I said, don't worry. I'm from Canada. I'll scold them and then leave. <laughs> I'll leave Malaysia. No problem. <laughs> he says, thank you, Bante, but I'll talk to my parents myself. Because he was very intelligent, and you realize it's their problem, it's not his. He said, yes, you do that. But again, if you're too shy, you ask me and I'll do it for you, because I don't care. I'm very outspoken, you know, especially when I see this type of deluded, destructive behavior. It's very harmful. What is interesting to most people, when they compare themselves, they will experience, you know, inferiority complex. But on a rare occasion, somebody will feel superior. You know, I'm better than. Mm. I'm smarter than, and so on. But what is interesting, even the individuals who feel superior, behind that superiority complex is fear, mm. insecurity. Because any form of attachment to this I, mm, breeds fear, insecurity. Mm. <coughs> Very interesting. And as we said, when we compare, then the craving arises. You know, we want to be as good as that person, we want to be as successful. Mm. And in some cases, I wish I was enlightened like that person. <laughs> and every time we have this some kind of desire, craving, behind that is fear. Hmm? The fear of not succe being successful, the fear of not achieving what I want to, to achieve. Have you noticed that? How uh, very often desire or craving and fear, how they go together. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, the fear, the worry, 
of not getting what you want. Mm, or you want to have, s you know, things a certain way, and the anxiety arises that, you know, I won't have, have things going the way I want them to be. Mm. Very interesting how fear and desire often go together. Mm. <coughs> Now the fear of change comes from not really understanding that we are alive, we exist because of change, because of impermanence. Because for many people when they first hear the teaching of impermanence, that things are always changing, s initially some people find this very uncomfortable because you know because of personal attachment we want certain things and we want certain people to be permanent right not to change because of our personal attachments for example if you don't like somebody you don't care if they are impermanent right let's be honest now, if somebody has a heart attack and drop dead, thank God. <laughs> Good riddance. Mm? Or if they get kidnapped, you know, by some aliens and taken away to a solar system very far away. Good riddance. Very interesting. But wh what is interesting is that we are alive because we are a process of body and mind, or mind and body. Mm. In Pali it's called Nama Rupa, or Rupa Nama, you know, mental and physical phenomena. If we weren't a process, we wouldn't be alive. It's so obvious. But what is so interesting in our human world, we tend to overlook this fact all the time, although it is so obvious. And we overlook this fact because we are social creatures. We use language, we use labels, you know, I, you, he, she, and we use names, right? So we tend to see each other as personalities, you know, as selves, as ego personalities, because we are caught in this social world, what we call social convention. And yes, we have to exist in the social convention but it's not permanent reality, it's still convention. It's like our names are still just labels, they're not who we really are. Mm, just like when you look at that image in the mirror, you think that's who you are, but actually it's not. But there's reality, this is why mindfulness being present is so important, because then you see the truth of it. No. The process of body and mind constantly changing. <coughs> and of course when you go deeper you have the five aggregates, right? And they're always working in daily life. Maybe tonight I don't have enough time, but I'd like to give an example, a simple example of these five things working. Because initially when we hear about the five aggregates, it seems complicated. You know, physical form, feeling sensation, perception, mental formation, mental reaction, and consciousness. Sounds a bit complicated. How is that related to our daily experience? So this is why I like to give a simple example of these five things working, and then you can relate to it. Oh, I might not have enough time this evening. What? What is so interesting is that these five things are working all the time in daily experience. Very fascinating. Mm. And you go a bit deeper and you have the elements, elements existing. And this is one of the reflections I like to do, especially on a retreat, because when we first hear or read about the elements, you know, earth, water, heat, air, space, it's just a concept. I remember when I first read it, I quickly turned the page over for something more interesting. <laughs> I didn't take it seriously, just an idea, just a concept. 
But when you have time to investigate, then it's no longer a concept. You really see the truth of these elements. Hmm? How we exist because of earth, water, heat, air, space, consciousness. You really see the truth of it. It's amazing. And you get to a, to a stage where you realize that we're just a collection of elements pretending to be people. That's right. <laughs> And this collection of, of elements sitting here is just pretending to be Bante Kovida from Canada. And your collection of elements is pretending who you think you are. <laughs> but in the end, it's just elements. And if you really want to know what continues after death, w which is the uh, million dollar question, or million dollar ringgit question, is the elements, they go back to nature. Mm. Fascinating, fascinating. Mm. But I'll save that for a, a rainy day. <laughs> but again, when we understand the truth of change, how we exist because of this constant process of body and mind and the elements, and then w we won't be afraid of change, and we understand that we have the fear because of our own personal clinging, right? That anything we are attached to, including people, material things, certain situation, because of our own personal clinging, we don't want those things to change. And that's why we hold on. Because we think, I am permanent, so anything I like, or anything I'm attached to, we want those things to be permanent. Mm. Mm. So again, it's a delusion that we suffer from. Just mm. like the fear of loneliness and isolation. Mm. Mm. It comes from, of course, having a very restless, agitated mind. Because you find that when you're very calm, very peaceful in your practice, you don't have that fear, right? You don't have that fear of loneliness and isolation. You feel very peaceful, very comfortable, just being alone. Because the truth is we are alone, whether we like it or not. It's a basic fact of life. We call it aloneness. Hmm? You come to t the, the, the understanding of this natural aloneness, which is different from loneliness. As they say, we are born alone and we die alone. It's just a fact of life. And as you know, when you're hungry, no one can eat for you. Mm? Not even your best friend. <laughs> right? And the most obvious thing, if you have to go to washroom, no one can go f for you. Mm? Even if your best friend or partner offered to go. No, my, you stay here, la, I go for you. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, right? It's, it's just a fact of life. Yeah, the natural aloneness. And when we understand that, we can be at peace. Mm. We, we don't depend so much on, uh, on others. Mm. But that dependency, again, comes from just that restlessness, right? The agitation. And you find that when we are more calm, more peaceful, naturally we have less reactions, less craving, less anxiety. This is why this very wise teacher, I think it was Achan Cha, he said a very wonderful thing. He said, you know, the world is in a very feverish state, you know, agitated, restless. The mind is changing from liking to disliking, from craving to aversion, from anxiety to frustration, mm, with the feverishness, agitation of the world. If we can learn to make the mind still, it will be the greatest blessing to the world. It's wonderful, very wonderful. Because the world is not out there, the world is here. It begins here. Mm. Mm. The world of mind and body, the world of consciousness, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking. This is the world, it begins here, it's not out there. Mm. 
is a very profound teaching. But when we practice, we begin to see the truth of that. Otherwise, we think, okay, I am here, but the world is out there. <laughs> but the real world is here. It all starts here. Hmm. Yes, we said uh, the fear of authority and the fear of ghosts and spirits. There's a connection. The connection is they're from childhood, childhood conditioning. And the fear of authority usually starts in the home environment. You know, you either have one parent who's really strict or sometimes both parents, that's where it starts. Hmm? Hmm, the fear of authority. And especially, as I said, if your parents are strict and maybe they give you a beating sometimes. <coughs> or of course, lots of scolding. And you carry that fear into, into the school environment, right? Fear of the teacher. And especially the principal, right? The headmaster. In my school, all teachers were allowed to beat, beat the students. But in, in, in high school, only the headmaster, the principal, was allowed to beat or cane, you know, cane or beat you. Mm. I don't know about in Malaysia. Mm. But you have that fear, that authority. And in the work environment, you have fear of the, of the boss, right, the supervisor. And sometimes the, there's a fear of the head monk also in a temple. <laughs> Especially if he's, you know, if, if he's really stern, right, more serious, very stern. Oh, you know, chief reverend, stay away from him. <laughs> he's going to scold you. <laughs> mm, that fear of authority. Yeah. So it starts in childhood. Mm. Likewise, the fear of ghosts and spirits, right? It's, it's an early uh, conditioning in your mind. You know, when I encourage people to, to do the, the graveyard, uh, cemetery graveyard uh, meditation, I explain to them that I grew up, where I grew up in the West Indies, I was conditioned with African ghosts and spirits. Because mm? we had the African slavery. Mm? You know, the Europeans brought the, 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 the slaves from West Africa to grow sugar cane because sugar was so profitable in England and Europe. So profitable. But it was a very cruel system. And we have a, in African story, there's a strong oral tradition, very creative storytelling. So I, I grew up with all these African ghosts and spirits. And of course, you believe them when you're young. So I tell the people here that because I grew up with African ghosts and spirits, I'm not afraid of the Chinese ghosts and spirits. <laughs> <laughs> they are mild in comparison <laughs> to the African ones. <laughs> But of course, it takes mindfulness, and you can overcome them. But it's all in the mind, you know, the power of the imagination, right? You imagine these ghosts and spirits. And sometimes you, you swear to God that you see them. Because I remember sometimes I would, you know, I would see ghosts. And initially you think they're real, but then later when you reflect on it, you realize it's just in the imagination, right? The power of the imagination. You think it's real. I don't know when you were young, you had the experience, you know, you wake up at night, be, you know, you have to go to the washroom, and oh my God, there's a ghost there in the room. And you want to go to the washroom, but you can't, because the ghost is there. And you cover your head, and you're sweating, and somehow you manage to fall asleep, and sometimes you wet the bed. And you wake up in the morning, and you realize it's your mother's uh, dress hanging up, you know? But in the dark, you think it's a ghost. Is that the illusion of a snake, right? You think it's a snake. But in the morning, you look and it's a piece of rope mm, or water hose, right? The, the hose, you think. But at night, you think it's a snake. The same thing. Fear of physical or emotional pain. 
this comes from a from memory you know you've had say you've experienced physical pain or emotional pain and when you remember it that physical or emotional pain naturally you don't want to repeat that experience because it's painful hence the fear of this pain mm, whether it's physical or it's emotional whereas if you've had a very pleasurable experience the opposite happens you can't hold on to the experience but the mind holds on to it as memory hmm? right you remember hmm? that pleasure that wonderful experience you have and naturally when you remember that pleasant experience that enjoyment you want to repeat it hmm? this is one, an aspect of craving anything that feels good anything that's pleasant we naturally want to repeat it it's a very common thing in hum in the human condition whereas if you remember something painful or unpleasant of course we don't want to repeat it right mm. it's natural mm. hence that fear mm. fear of anything painful anything unpleasant fear of public opinion <coughs> that comes from of course insecurity not really understanding ourselves not being confident and as we said the more we compare ourselves we become more insecure you know more inferior and of course you create a negative image of yourself you know I'm not as good you know as so and so and you, you know you have this negative image of yourself mm, as somehow not as good mm, not as successful not as smart and so on so you have this image and somehow you want to protect that image even if it's negative of course it's better to have a a, a positive image of yourself but even if you, if you cling to a positive image you still want to protect it so you're very concerned about what people are saying about you because you're clinging to this image of course if it's pleasant of course you're happy you you know you want to hear good things all the time but if it's negative or it's critical of course there is fear right we all experience this and a, a part of a wisdom is is understanding that you can never please everyone mm. even as a Dhamma teacher you could give the most profound talk but there are some people nah I don't like it or sometimes I don't understand it's like that mm. praise and blame you can't please everyone you could be the nicest person on this planet but you'll always find one or two people who are just not impressed with you because <laughs> that's the world that's the nature of the world you know praise and blame mm. and when we understand that you can be how do you say you you understand that yeah. And you you you're not so concerned about image, because it's all relative. Yes, if somebody says nice things to you, you can say thank you. But don't be attached to it. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And if somebody says something negative or you or criticizes you, you can even say thank you. And if you can't say thank you, at least smile. <laughs> Just smile. And if you're really wise, just say, yeah, you're right, you're right. Whatever it is, you're right. Mm. No argument. Mm. You know that story? I think maybe Achen Brahm told it. It's a very well-known story about the two friends they are arguing. And they keep arguing, you know, each of them clinging strongly to their opinion. 
and they're not getting anywhere. So they said, we're wasting time. Let's stop. I will go to see the, w the wise man in the village. You know that story? I think some of you know. So one of the friends had to do something. So the other friend went by himself <coughs> to meet the wise man. And he told the wise man the nature of the argument and his point of view. And anxiously he says, well, so who is right, me or my friend? And the wise man says, of course, you're right. So happily, <laughs> he was running off to find his friend to tell him what the wise man has said. <coughs> Excuse me. So the next day, the other friend comes, and he's very upset because he wants to be right. And anxiously, he tells the wise man his, his point of view. And then he said, well, so who's right now, me or my friend? And the wise man says, you are right, of course. Same thing, and of course, he's very happy. He goes running off to tell the friend. <coughs> then the wife of the wise man comes out of the kitchen, because she was, in the kitchen cooking and she was listening to the argument and she's very upset. I think some of you know this story. And she says, I don't know why you waste time with those two idiots <laughs> and their stupid argument. You're obviously having nothing better to do. You should be c helping me in the kitchen. <laughs> right? Many wives can uh, relate to this experience. Just wasting time with these two idiots. And she said, also, I cannot understand your wisdom. You know, first you tell this joker he's right, and you tell the other joker he's also right. What kind of wisdom is that? As far as I'm concerned, they're just two stupid idiots. And she said to her husband, people in this village might think you are the wise man, but to me, I've been married to you for 40 years, and to, be, to me, you're just a stupid old fool. And he smiles with her, with love, with compassion, and he says, you know, my dear, you're right. <laughs> that is real wisdom. You tell everyone they are right. No argument. But deep d down, you know they're all wrong. <laughs> That is real wisdom, you know, not clinging to a certain point of view. Oh, yeah, you're all right, you're all right. Mm. No argument, no problem. <coughs> so the question is, is it possible not to have an image of yourself, whether it's positive or negative? Is it possible? You know, that I am this or I am that. Is it possible? And I would say it is possible from my own experience. It means not to cling to what the mind is creating you know, about who you are or who you think you are and just rest in that present moment awareness, that knowing. You put your trust in present moment awareness and intuitive knowing. Mm, the Buddha nature. The unconditioned mind. And this is the real meaning of taking refuge in the Buddha. Not just chanting, you know, Buddha, I'm Saranam, Gachami, blah, blah, blah. There's just tradition, ceremony. But the real refuge is this. When you understand present moment awareness and knowing the real Buddha nature we all have this Buddha nature the wisdom mind the unconditioned <coughs> but initially it's difficult for us to do that because we are so attached we identify so strongly with the thinking process hmm? and the eye and the images that the mind creates 
on all our mental formations. You know, our views and opinions, our ideas, our beliefs, our concepts, our likes and dislikes. We're so attached to them because we identify so strongly with them. <coughs> and every time the mind says, I, we think this I is who we are. And that's just something the Buddha realized, that this I is not who we are. It's just a thought, it's just this label, right? The social label that we have. You know, I, you, he, she. Mm -hmm. Who we really are is the awareness that can see the impermanent nature of thinking, of thoughts, of ideas, concepts. That is the awakening. <coughs> And when we understand that, then we put this trust, we rest in that present moment awareness. And the knowing, you know, you, I, th I think you understand about knowing, the intuitive knowing that comes. And when we have this, then we're free of this image that, you know, that we're so attached to, mm -hmm. whether it's negative or or uh, or positive, because <coughs> we're always trying to protect this image, right? At all cost, we protect it, and of course, with that comes fear, anxiety, and so on. We want praise; we're afraid of blame. Mm -hmm. We want happiness; we're afraid of unhappiness. Mm. We want pleasure, we're afraid of pain. <coughs> mm. We want gain, always gaining, having more and more, and at the same time we're afraid of loss. And for some people, they want fame, and at the same time they're afraid of, you know, the opposite, ill fame. And I've come to understand that fame and ill fame, there's a very thin line between those two things. Very thin line. Mm -hmm. One moment you can be very famous, and just the next moment you can be subject to ill fame. And a good example of this was Michael Jackson. You know Michael Jackson? Yeah, he was somebody who experienced, you know, great fame, incredible, enormous fame. But towards the end of his life, he experienced the opposite, mm -hmm. ill fame. <coughs> all impermanent, all impermanent. So there's great freedom in not having the, an image of yourself. The great freedom in that. Mm -hmm. So we're then we're not affected by public opinion by what people say. Mm. <coughs> and also you find, as you said, the, the more you think about the future, the more you worry about the future, naturally you have more anxiety. Mm. More anxiety. Because we can all relate to that. And y you can remember when you're a student, whether it's in high school or university level, you have this anxiety. I suffered a great deal from it. And you feel that tension all the time, you know, the fear of not, you know, graduating, not passing your exams. And after that, you project, and you think, oh my God, you know, will I get, you know, a good job? And later on, you know, once I'm working, you know, will I able to get married? You know, you know, will I find the right partner and all this stuff? And family, if you're into family, you know, am I going to have a family? All this anxiety. Mm. I'm just feeling that anxiety all the time. Mm. And I realize this is not a way to live. And once I looked at my mind and I thought, is it possible for all this anxious thinking, all this craziness to stop? All this mental, emotional turmoil to come to an end? I remember asking that, but no one could give me an answer. 
And I didn't have any Dharma books around, no yoga, meditation, Qigong, nothing. <coughs> and my only escape was drinking. Because, you know, in uni you're allowed to drink, at least in Canada. And the best thing that happened to me was meeting two people who had gone to India. Because in those early days, 60s, 70s, 80s, you could go through I, uh, Europe, then Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, into India. It was very stable, all these countries. Afghanistan, Iran, all those countries. And that inspired me, and I was able to do this. The they called it the Overland Journey. In the, in the winter of uh, 74, 75. That's the best thing I ever did. And I had such profound experiences, and I discovered it was possible for the mind to be silent. But initially you can't imagine, right? The mind. How can the mind be silent? How can thinking stop? But as you know, you can't force the mind to stop thinking. And believe me, many people have tried. Even the early forest yogis. You know, they would sit and they try to stop thinking. And I think this is how migraine headaches began. <laughs> yeah. Because what they didn't realize was that the thinker, the I, that is trying to stop thinking is also a part of thinking. Hmm? So it's like thinking trying to stop thinking. Or thinking trying to control thinking. You can't. You only get tension and headaches and all that stuff. You allow it with patience right effort to come to an end and you experience that total silence. Because initially you think, oh, yo, if thinking stops, I'm going to die. Right? I'm going to lose consciousness and that's the end of me. <laughs> but when you experience, it's, it just, it's the most wonderful thing to have this experience, this awakening. And when the mind becomes silent, especially if you're in a very beautiful environment, suddenly your mind opens up to vast space. Mm, you, your mind becomes very spacious. Because awareness by nature is spacious. Mm, for example, it's because of awareness we're aware of the space in this room. But if you're always thinking and identifying with thoughts, ideas, concepts, and the I, of course there's no space. Mm. And you experience this for yourself. Mm. And you see that silence and space go together. And the second thing I realized in that total silence and spaciousness, time had stopped. Mm. No past, no future. Because it's thinking that creates time. Mm. Thinking is a movement in time from past to future, past to future. And you can see that, right? In your own, in your own practice. Because one of the questions I was asking also is what is thinking? What is thinking? You know, you go through school, and they're teaching you all these subjects and you have to study to pass exams and you're thinking all the time but nobody teaches us to understand what is thinking. Only I got to India and this profound teacher pointed it out to me. It was such an amazing insight. And it's so simple, that is the thing. It's not rocket science. It's not complicated. Thinking is a response, is related to three things in the mind. Memory, that's obvious, isn't it? Past experience, of course. And knowledge, information. You can see that. Thinking, that's where thinking is coming from. And as you know, it has the ability to project in the future. All our minds do this. And it doesn't matter what language you're thinking in, it's the same thought process. 
whether it's Cantonese, Hokkien, Japanese, Russian, French, Spanish, the same thought process, moving in time, hmm? it's a movement in time. And in your own practice, when you experience the silence, the stillness, there's no time. You're actually in touch with the timeless dimension of the universe. Because we, the universe is timeless. But humans are caught in time because of thinking and our conditioning. And we have now created schedule, and we've created, you know, the calendar, months, weeks, and now we have digital time. Of course, in daily life, we have to use time, we have to use schedule, we can't escape it mm, if you're in the working world. But it's very healthy, very beneficial when we can at least half an hour each day just to quiet the mind and just to experience again the timeless silence. Because that is the taste of Nibbana, when you experience this, that silence, that stillness, timelessness. Because time is also a factor of fear, right, of anxiety and stress also. Stress is always related to time, right? There's so much to do and so little time. This is why the practice is so important. Now, what are the factors of fear? There are three. We've been speaking about the different types of fears we have. What are the connecting factors? Now, if it is mental, psychological fear, what is the most obvious factor? Hmm? Mental, psychological, what is the main factor? What is the most obvious factor? If it's mental, psychological. Can you say? It's what? F did you say thought? Yes, that's right, thinking. It's so obvious, isn't it? Thinking I is the main factor. If it's mental, it must be thinking. You know, worrying, anxiety, projecting, craving, all this stuff. Worry. It is thinking. Thinking is the, is the main culprit, as you <laughs> want to use that word. It's the main factor of fear. And the other two factors, because it's thinking, time is a factor, as we said. You know, past and future. time. That's very obvious. Mm. When we project in the future, you know, Ayo, what's going to happen? Will I achieve? Will I do this? Blah, 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 blah. Mm. And the, you, 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 you remember past things you've done and you have the regret and then the guilt and all that stuff. <coughs> Do you see how time is related? Because thinking is related to time. And of course, the third factor is uh, craving, uh, desire, craving, desire, wanting. Because with that comes the fear of not getting what you want, mm, not achieving what you'd like to achieve. Can you see that? Mm, that's right. Thinking, time, and craving, desire. Mm. And that includes expectation. Expectation. That's a form of craving, isn't it? And when you're in a relationship with somebody, you know that it's very easy for expectations to arise. Very easy. But initially, we don't see it as craving. You just think, think you know, it's a part of just being in a relationship or being in love. Mm. So you expect all these things from that person and you depend on that person for your happiness. And that's why we have the fear of loss. That's where it comes from. 
because you're depending, you know, emotionally, you're depending on something or someone for your happiness, for your security. Mm, and that dependency naturally breeds fear. Mm, you fear that you're going to lose something or that person or whatever you're depending on. It can even be a reputation, right? You have a certain reputation or a certain status. Mm. So you fear of losing that reputation, that status, mm. dependency. Now there's a difference between emotional dependency and physical dependency. There's a difference. Now, as human beings, sometimes we have to depend on each other, right? We can help each other in so many ways. That's very natural. Just like the mailman, you have to depend on the mailman to deliver your letters, right? But there's no need to be attached to him. You know what I mean? Oh, mailman, please. Please stay or please come every day. I want to see you. <laughs> No, you don't have to do that. So you see the difference. Hmm? Yeah, it's the emotional attachment, that dependency that creates fear, huh? the fear of loss. And the fear of sickness, aging, and death comes from not understanding that this body is not really, you know, a personal thing. Hmm? It doesn't belong to us. It's not me, it's not mine. It belongs to the changing conditions of nature. Mm. As what Achan Shah said, I if you tell the body not to, get to s not to get sick, does it listen to us? No. Mm. If you tell the body not to get tired, not to get hungry, you know, not to go to washroom, the body does these things, whether we like it or not, because it follows its own natural law. It is non-self, anatta. Tell the body not to age, the body ages. If you tell the body not to die, the body will die. Of course, we have to take care of the body as best we can, but we can't get too attached to it. Mm. It's just like, say, if you're renting a house or renting an apartment, it doesn't belong to you, you know, legally, but you still have to take care of it, right? The apartment or your house. You keep it clean. If something is broken, you fix it. <coughs> and even if the apartment or your house belongs to you officially, you know, legally, if you're able to pay off, you know, mortgage and all that stuff, eventually you still have to leave it, don't we? Mm. You know, whether it's a small apartment or a big mansion, the same thing. It's just a temporary shelter. <coughs> Non-self. And I don't know if, if we have time to go into this very fascinating subject of the unknown. Mm? The fear of the unknown. And why we want to believe in an afterlife. How are we doing for time? Speaking of time, and fear, oh my God. <laughs> How are we doing for time? Yeah, I don't have to work tomorrow morning. <laughs> Evening I have to give a talk, but so I can be late. Would you like to go into this fear of the unknown? Because I really like the subject. I must say, I'm very attached to this one subject. <laughs> My one attachment. <laughs> now, most people, when they, when they first see a dead body, they will say the same thing. And what is that? That person looks so peaceful, like they're sleeping. You know that saying? Most people will say that when they first see a dead body. Wow, so peaceful, like they're sleeping. Now why do we say that? Because we can relate to somebody lying there as being asleep. We can all relate to that. But what most of us c don't really understand is that, for example, is no longer a person. 
you know, a dead body is no longer a person, you know, person that you know. And also, most of us can't really relate that so-called person that's lying there sleeping <laughs> or seemingly, seemingly to sleep has absolutely no life. You know, dead, dead, dead. No energy, no thoughts, no feelings, no, you know, no memory, no I. Absolutely no life. Now, if, if you speak to people who are, who are dealing with dead bodies on a daily basis, you know, medical people, people who work, you know, funeral homes and all that stuff, they will tell you it's very normal. And they will tell you that because they're used to it. But most of us who are not used to it, there is the fear, isn't it? Can you imagine sp being in a room with a dead body, even for 10 minutes? Ayo. And you have, ca you have had cases too, even for medical people, where sometimes the body would sit up. You know, so there's some reaction, reflex, and the body would sit up. Can you imagine how scared you'd be? <laughs> or sometimes the belch, you know, the gas would come. Ayo, you're so scared. It's very interesting. So it is the unknown. <laughs> and we don't know. We really don't know. So because of this fear of the unknown, we create so many different beliefs hmm? in an afterlife. You can understand it. <coughs> now there's a reason for this. And it has to do with our minds, our thinking mind. You see, thinking, as we said, is related to all that which we know. Hmm? Memory, past experience, knowledge, information. You see that. Or thinking is related to this, hmm? that which we know. So when it, when it encounters death and the unknown, because we really don't know what happens after death, it cannot relate to the unknown. It's really amazing, when you interesting when you think of it. I, it's like a, a fish trying to relate to the experience of riding a bicycle. It cannot. You, you see that, right? A fish can't relate to riding a bicycle or driving a car or using internet. A fish cannot relate to those experiences. Likewise, our conditioning, uh, our thinking mind with memory, information, knowledge, it cannot relate to this great unknown. So naturally there's fear. Hmm? Fear of the unknown. And that's why humans for thousands and thousands of years have been asking the same question. It's called the age-old question. People have been and people are still asking the same question today and in future they'll be asking the same question. And what is that? What happens to me when I die, right? And where do I go after death? Very ancient question. And you, are, you can understand. Because we are caught in thinking, and of course we are attached to this I. What happens, right? What happens to this I? Because the truth is, I want to continue, don't I? <laughs> Preferably with all our attachments, all the things we like, right? We want it to continue somehow. It's very natural. It's a great mystery. Sometimes when people ask me this question, I say, uh, wait and see. <laughs> then you know for sure. Or sometimes I just joke and says, why are you asking me this? I'm still alive. <laughs> you know, wait till I'm dead, then you can ask me. <laughs> <laughs> then I can give you an ex expert opinion. But I, it's jokingly. But you see, because of this great unknown, thinking cannot relate to it. So what thinking does, it's very clever. It projects itself beyond death. And they say, oh yeah, I will continue after that somehow. 
you know, in a belief. Whether it's reincarnation or, you know, I'm going to take rebirth. And if you're a Pure Land Buddhism, of course, I'll be reborn in the Pure Land. It's very comforting, isn't it? And if you're a Christian, I'm going to have eternal life after death, you know, with Jesus or with God. Very comforting. And the North American Indians would like to say, I'm going to go to the great hunting ground in the sky. Because for them, hunting the buffalo you know, was one of their great activities. <coughs> a concept of heaven and say if you love McDonald's I'm going to go to the great McDonald's in the sky or KFC or Pizza Hut whatever you like I was speaking to a man who he really loves golf you know golf is a game you either love it or you don't like it right it's like that it's like durian <laughs> you love it with a passion or you hate it with a passion, it's like that. And his concept of heaven, of course, is this golf course. I'm going to be in this, heaven is a golf course, and it's free membership. <laughs> and I can play 24 seven. And if you love internet, yeah, yeah. Heaven is, I'm going to be in a place, free high speed internet, all day and night. Mm, that's the human mind, isn't it, projecting. Or some people say, you know, if, you know, if I'm, I'm a successful writer, I have all these books, mm, I will live forever in my books. And I used to see some old Hollywood movie stars, the ones that I grew up with in the early days. And they say, I will live forever in my movies. Which is a very comforting thought, isn't it? Or I live forever, you know, in my TV shows. It's very comforting. And when it comes to the Chinese culture, the traditional Chinese man wants sons and grandsons. And of course, future, you know, great grandsons. Why is that? Because he believes that as long as the family name continues, I will continue. Do you see that? Yeah, it's a very old Chinese tradition. The, the daughters are not important because when they marry, they marry into the other family and they don't carry on the family name. And that is the real reason why sons, grandsons are more important in that ancient Chinese way of thinking. is because of the family name, the idea that I will continue somehow. Very interesting. But of course, it's an illusion. It's craving. <laughs> it's wishful thinking. Now, when you investigate all these beliefs mm, that we have created, you see that really it is thinking itself. You know, this movement in time is afraid to come to an end. Do you see that? Mm? Or everything that we know, including all our attachments, whether it's material, other people, etc., etc., it's afraid to come to an end. That is the essence of it. And so we create these beliefs. Now what is really insightful and wonderful is that when we allow the mind to be silent in meditation, we begin to understand that silence is the unknown. Hmm? Thinking is, the n is what we know, right? Memory, experience, knowledge, information. And the ending o of this, of thinking, is the unknown. Do you see that? And when we understand this, and we experience it, you know what happens? We experience the unknown in that silence of meditation. Because we understand it is the unknown, the ending of thought. And uh, there is no longer fear of the unknown. 
because we experience it directly as something very peaceful and timeless. Mm? There is no time. This is very profound, but it's a very wonderful insight to understand the stillness of the mind, that silence is the unknown. There's nothing to fear. It's a very peaceful state and timeless. And so that age-old question, hmm, what happens to me when I die, where do I go after death, does not arise. Hmm? I wonder if you see that. It does not need to arise. That's right. But as long as we are trapped in thinking, you know, and we are deluded by thinking and with this I, of course, we keep asking that question. Hmm? And we want to believe somehow in an afterlife. It's a very profound insight. But just reflect on it. Reflect on it and you will see this wonderful, wonderful uh, freedom. The silence and the unknown. Also, what is interesting is that language is very misleading. For example, we tend to say, I came into this world, or we came into this world. Hmm? Now, look at that statement more closely. I came into this world, we came into this world. Look at it very closely. It gives the impression that we came from somewhere else, you know, like a, another solar system, and we landed here in our spaceship, and we're aliens, you know, like we're tourists. To you, you see that illusion that I am somehow, we're separate? We came here, somehow we're separate from the world, and we came here as aliens. That's the illusion of language and duality, mm? that I am separate or we're separate from the world. But in truth, we didn't come into the world as, you know, aliens from another solar system, but rather we came out of the world. We came out of the world like leaves, flowers, and fruits from trees. You see the difference? Do you see that difference? Or like waves from the surface of the ocean. We're not. We are the world. We are the planet in this temporary physical form, being aware of itself. Mm. And we're composed of energy, all the elements, which is energy, mm. and the heat from the sun. Mm. You see the difference? In other words, we are really earthlings. <laughs> the true meaning of the word earthlings. We don't hear that word very often anymore. You used to hear it like in science fiction movies, Earthling. <laughs> but the, the true meaning is this. Mm. We are the world. We are the planet in this temporary physical form being aware of itself. Just like other life forms, you know, cats and dogs and fish and bird are also aspects of the planet. Mm. With this awareness, the consciousness. And it's all energy, as we said. Mm. The elements, the sun. And this is related to the teaching of non-self, huh? emptiness. Mm. To go beyond duality, the, uh, the illusion of separation. Mm. And the model of the ocean, the surface of the ocean is very beautiful. You know, waves arise, countless waves rise and fall, but the ocean remains the same. Waves are water, water is waves. Mm -hmm. Waves are not separate from the ocean. Likewise, we are not separate from the energy, the, the, the elements of the planet. Mm -hmm. Just like all the food we eat is an aspect of the planet mm -hmm. and the elements and the energy of the sun and rain 
and so on. Mm. It's a very beautiful reflection. Mm. And this is really the essence of, of the Buddha's teaching, that liberation from the idea of self, mm, of a separate self. And on a more cosmic scale, we are the un universe. Mm. In this temporary physical form, being aware of itself. Mm. So really, there's nowhere to go. <laughs> there's really nowhere to go. Mm. Yeah, another time we'll go into the elements. It's, it's also very profound, the elements. Okay, at this point, any, any questions? Any questions? That's a good question. Okay, first of all, the belief in reincarnation comes from believing that this I is permanent, right? And it's very ancient. All the hu ancient human civilization believe that this eye is permanent. It is separate, it's independent. So when the bo this body dies, which it must, this s solid you know, eye will be reborn, will reincarnate into a new body. Right? Very ancient. And, and, and in the Indian culture that in which Siddhartha Gautama grew up in, had this belief. Now, rebirth, I know sometimes you read about it in the sutta, that belief still has that reincarnation idea that somehow something continues. But many Buddhists say, no, no, it's not the eye that continues because there's no permanent eye, but it is consciousness mm? with all the karma. Right? Whether it's positive or negative, that continues. But from my own understanding, and you must remember this is only my understanding. I'm not saying you should accept this. Rebirth is not this, that something continues into a new body, but rebirth has to do with the mind, mental rebirth. Now what does that mean? It means a repeated arising. Of craving, attachment, mm, aversion, delusion, and the I. It, keep, it keeps coming back. So in other words, the aim in practice is to stop it. Or at least to lessen eh, the kilesa, you know, the, the, all the defilements. Because it's all defilements that cause suffering. So we have more peace and less dukkha. Does that make sense? Mm. But I, I can understand the difficulty because even the word rebirth, again, it's, it's misleading. Just like w birth and death. You know, for example, when I say birth, when I say death, first we think of physical birth, physical death, don't we? You know, a baby being born and someone dying. Yes, you have physical birth, physical death, but there's much more to birth and death. Because when we are very aware in the present moment, we begin to see birth and death as not just physical birth, physical death, but things arising, things passing away constantly. Mm -hmm. The arising of thoughts, the passing away of thoughts, feelings come and go. You see that? Yeah. Again, the process, as you said, things arising, passing away or constantly. Just like in-breath, out-breath. You can see that, don't you? In-breath, out-breath, rising and falling. Another good example is just touch your, uh, your finger, just touch your hand.
just the arising of touch sensation. But wh because we use the word birth and death, it's misleading. Mm -hmm. We think of something physical, just like rebirth. Mm -hmm. Something going into a new body. Mm -hmm. But it's really arising, passing away, arising, passing away. So in other words, our existence, this process of body and mind, is a continuous arising and passing away. And of course, when, when we practice, we can see this, don't we? That's right. Mm -hmm. Things arising, things passing away. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you could see the details of all the cells in our body, it's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. But normally, you know, with the naked eye, we, we don't see these things. Because mm -hmm. we're just so too busy running around. You know, once I took a course in biochemistry, and we were studying the digestion system, you know, when we eat food. Fortunately, when we eat, we don't have to worry about, f you know, digestion, unless you're having a digestion problem. But most of us, we don't think of it, because the body has its own intelligence. But when you study that, the, the direct uh, digestion process, my goodness, it's very, very complex. You know, all the different en enzymes, these acids, it's so complex. But fortunately, most of us don't have to worry about it. You know, the intelligence of the body. It's amazing, this process. We just take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Unless you're having digestion problem. Yeah. And I knew a Canadian lady, she had digestion problem, uh, living in India, doing volunteer work. And she went to one of these natural cure places in India related to Mahatma Gandhi Foundation. And she went on this special fast just to give the body a complete rest. And can you imagine, she fasted for one month. And only thing she took, every hour she had a, a, a teaspoon of water. Just a teaspoon, because you know, the body needs water, the cells. Just to give the body a complete rest. And every day, you know, the, the, the doctors checked her heart, you know, high blood pressure, all this stuff. And she got, you know, uh, Ayurvedic herbal massage. She did yoga. And if you're ever fasted, the first two days are the most difficult. Because all you think about is food. <laughs> but luckily, after two days, the hunger goes away and you feel so wonderful. You feel so light, so peaceful, and very calm. But you have to survive the first two days. And you go through all the recipes, all the food you have ever cooked, goes through your mind. And all the makan you have experienced in this country, the mind. But once that hunger goes away, it's so wonderful. And she said after two weeks, she felt she could survive for the rest of her life not eating. But of course, eventually, you'll have to e start eating. And she felt like she was floating, you know. The body just felt so light, her mind so clear. But finally, after, you know, one month, she had to break the fast. And when you're on such a long fast, how you break the fast is very important. It has to be very gradual. Mm -hmm. First of all, just some diluted juice. Just a little juice with water, very diluted first. And then just normal juice. And then things like, you know, milk, yogurt, just liquids, and eventually, you know, like porridge, you know, kanji, juk. Very, very gradual. She says she never felt so, so healthy in her life. Very light, very clear. Mm. Actually, I would love to do this. I would love to go to India just to do one of these, uh, these long fasts. I've only done five days, but I would love to do a longer one. Maybe two weeks. Maybe two weeks would be good. So, very quickly, how do we deal with fear when it fear arises? We do what we do with mindfulness. We objectify the fear. Hmm? There is fear, or there's a state of fear. Not, I am afraid, or I'm scared. And you say, it is impermanent. And then what can be very special, you do some loving kindness. Hmm? Something very positive, 
and you allow the fear to dissipate, to go away mm. without struggle. Another way you can do the Thich Nhat Hanh style, the mindful breathing and smiling. Have you heard that one? Breathing in, I know there's fear in me. Breathing out, I smile. And you smile at that fear. And you say, it is impermanent. You know, this too shall pass. It's a very beautiful practice. Because when you smile mindfully, it's a very wholesome state of mind, isn't it? When you smile. So in other words, it's a smile of metta. Because you're not judging, eh? you're not judging the fear. Just like if you're angry, you're not judging the anger, you're not judging the craving or whatever you have in your mind. Mm, breathing in, I know there's upset in me. Breathing out, I smile. You just accept it is there. And you know it is impermanent. It's a very good practice, smiling. It's like the laughing yoga. You know about laughing yoga, right? Yeah. And sometimes when I do the qigong, we do laughing qigong too. Or just go, ah. <laughs> it's very good, very therapeutic. You know, letting go of negativity, stress, and so on. Anger, mm -hmm. frustration. Mm -hmm. And another way you can do chanting, mindful chanting. Maybe we, we can end with it. This chanting comes from the very profound teaching called the Heart Sutra. Have you heard of the Heart Sutra? Mm. Yeah, because you know it's chanted in many temples in Asia. It's very profound. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. And it goes about all the sense organs are all empty. It's all related to the teaching of non self emptiness. And at the end of it is this beautiful mantra Gate, gate, para, gate, para, sam, gate, And the meaning is beautiful. It says going beyond going well beyond, going beyond the world of ignorance, delusion, craving, aversion, attachment, fear, you know, dukkha, going beyond the world of dukkha. And bodhis bodhisvaha means rejoice in the bliss, freedom, and peace of awakening, mm -hmm. of enlightenment. Shall we end with that? Okay, I'll do it and you can join me if you wish. Very simple. And you find that it's an easy way to, to focus the mind. And I remember in Malaysia, a few people have told me that, Ayo Bante, I can't meditate at night alone. You know why? Because the ghost is going to come. Some people believe that. So I said, never mind, you chant. Do some chant. Whatever you It doesn't have to be any chant you like. Or sing a song. Sing a, any song you like. And believe me, the ghost will go away. Gatte, gatte, para, gatte, para, sam, gatte, bodhisvaha. Gatte, gatte, para, gatte, para, sam, gatte, bodhisvaha. Gatte, gatte, para, gatte, para, sam, gatte, bodhisvaha. Gatte, gatte, para, gatte, Parasam gatte bodhisvaha. Gatte gatte para gatte 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 para sam 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 gatte Gatte bodhisvaha. Gatte gatte para gatte para sam gatte bodhisvaha. Gatte gatte para gatte para sam gatte bodhisvaha. 
Gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhisva. 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 Okay, this um, I believe the, uh, this talk um, it's online. So if you Google um, the nature and ending of fear, mm. the I think the PDF file is there. The, the nature and ending of fear. And if you can't find it, then just download my book. I think uh, Brother Bobby has the the link. You just Google Bante Covida, and then click on an inquiring mind's journey. Google Bhante COVID, I click on Inquiring Mind's Journey. And one of the chapters is the nature and ending of fear. Mm. And there are some videos on YouTube, just type Bhante COVID. Mm. They were recorded in Singapore. And my email address is there, at the YouTube videos. Mm. So if you have any questions, please uh, don't be shy. Please ask any questions. Don't be afraid. <laughs> yes. An inquiring mind's journey. An inquiring mind's journey. No. No. I, I only chat the gate gate part because it's easy. I'm too lazy la. <laughs> but sometimes I like to um to speak about the heart sutra because it's really profound. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. And then all the senses, right? Uh, s eyes, nose, tongue, ears, seeing, hearing, smelling. How it's all empty. Mm. Mm. Meaning there's no I behind the senses. Mm. How the senses are sensing by themselves. It's a very profound insight. But initially we don't realize because we're always seeing, you know, I'm seeing this, I'm hearing, I'm smelling, I'm tasting, I'm touching, and of course I'm thinking. But when we practice, especially on a retreat, you see this, that the senses are actually sensing by themselves. Mm. It's automatic. It's just happening. But because we have the habit of identifying with these experiences, we say, you know, I'm seeing something, right? Or I'm hearing something. So we create a duality. Mm. We create a subject and an object. Eh? That there's an eye, a seer, that is seeing something. That is an I as a listener or a hearer that is hearing sound. Very, very interesting. Mm. How there's a taster, an I as a taster that is, you know, tasting food. But actually it's an illusion. 
And a good way, for example, next time you eat something, say to yourself, okay, I'm going to eat this and I'm going to try not to taste this. See what happens. You can't avoid it. Hmm? As long as you have taste buds on your tongue, tasting consciousness arises. There's no I there. Hmm. It's just tasting. And this is one of the profound insights of the Buddha. Hmm? That the senses are just happening by themselves. No one there. Including the I. There's no thinker separate from thoughts. Hmm? There's just thinking. And the, the thinker, the I, is just part of thinking. Hmm? And that's why trying to stop thinking gives uh, migraine headaches. <laughs> yes. Okay. Consciousness, th as the Buddha realized, is always connected to the senses. Hmm? Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking. As you know, the Buddha had the, the, the mind as the sixth sense. Whereas most of us are brought up with only five. But he saw that, because right? his, his insight was so profound. Now normally we think consciousness is something permanent in the mind, stuck somewhere. But actually when we practice and we understand the senses, we see that consciousness is always changing depending on our sense experience. For example, um, say you, you ate something before you came here, right? When, when you're eating, part of consciousness was tasting and smelling, right? But now there is no tasting or smelling. But what do we have now? Seeing, hearing, and feeling, right? You can feel your body sitting. Okay? Now close your eyes for a moment. There's no seeing consciousness with eyes closed, but there's still hearing and feeling, touching. Okay? Now open your eyes and seeing consciousness arises again. That's the nature of consciousness. It keeps changing. And when you go home, and say if you have a snack, again, tasting and smelling will arise again. Very interesting. So that's the nature of consciousness. It keeps changing. Nothing solid, nothing permanent. And what is interesting also, to add to this great mystery of life, when we all go to bed tonight and we fall asleep, guess what? There is no consciousness. At least for two hours. In deep sleep state, there is no consciousness. In other words, we die mentally every night for at least two hours. It's true. And that's why there's an old saying when somebody's in deep sleep, we say that person is dead to the world. You remember that saying? Yeah, the old people wi will remember the saying. It's a very famous old saying, you know? That person is dead to the world. Means y you're not aware of anything. Because in a way it's true. When in that deep sleep state, we're not aware of anything. So even if your ra radio is on, TV is on, in those two hours, there's no hearing consciousness. No thinking, no I. Yes. So when, when, when the brain comes out of that deep sleep state, usually it's about after two hours, then that's when the dream state starts up. You know, thought arises, and that's what we call the dream state. And if you observe your dreams and you write them down quickly before you forget them, you see most of our dreams are really just memories all mixed up. Have you noticed that? Because thinking is related to memory, right? Past experience, knowledge, information. And sometimes, if you have a certain fantasy, it will come out in your dream. You know, a certain desire. Sometimes, say, you have certain um, conflict in your life. Sometimes it comes out in your dream. Or an anxiety, right? We can all relate to having an anxious dream. And sometimes, we can all relate to this. You're having some important event coming up or, you know, some appointment, some very often you dream about it. Hmm? Or you're going to take a trip somewhere, and of course you're excited, 
very often you, you dream hmm? about flying off somewhere. I think you're, you're thinking too much. That's right. Uh -huh. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> no, you, okay, le quickly, le 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 let me try and answer your question. There are two parts of the mind. There's the conditioned mind, which is thinking, as we talk about, past and future, and the I is a part of the conditioning. And there's the unconditioned state of mind, which is awareness. You see that now? And the unconditioned awareness or mindfulness attention is always now present. It's not related to past and future. All that is conditioned, time. Hmm? Do you see that? So in other words, the awareness we had as children is the same awareness we have today. It never changes. The only difference is that now as adults and with Dharma understanding, Dharma practice, we can understand. Huh? We can understand thi this much better because a young child doesn't understand. Because I remember when I first had this awakening in India, I realized, wow, as a child, the mind used to be in that state. That's pure awareness looking at nature. Timeless. Each day was timeless. Can you remember that when you were young and playing outdoors? You had a sense of wonder and each day was timeless. Can you remember that? Yeah. Mm. But in North America, many children can't remember. You know why? Because they always had television. And now, of course, it's, it's even more difficult for kids because of video games and, you know, the endless electronic things. That's right. As children, we all experience this. But again, as children, we don't understand it. But it's a natural state. It's a natural state. Yeah. But it is fascinating, isn't it? The, this human uh, condition and consciousness. Yes. Aha, another million dollar or million ringgit uh, question. There is no purpose to life. <laughs> People ask me this, where was I born? What is the meaning of life? There's no special meaning. It's, uh, we're here because of biological conditions. Shall I go into detail <laughs> about your parents? getting together one night and having little fun. <laughs> well, it's the truth. And the conditions were there and you're born. It's that simple. But if you're intelligent, you have an, in, uh, an inquiring mind for the Dharma, you give your life meaning. Hmm? You give meaning to your life. That's right. Hmm? That's right. You give meaning to your life. For example, the Jewish people are brought up with this very unhealthy conditioning that we're here as, as you know, Jews for a special purpose. It's like having a big chip on your shoulder. Hmm? So you, you have a lot of guilt, like you must fulfill the special purpose. And if you don't, of course, there's guilt and shame and, you know, suffering. No. No, because as human beings, you know, we have emotions, we have intelligence, so we use it as best as we can. Yeah. For example, there were some people who became enlightened, but they were just not, they were not teaching, they were not interested in teaching, they just kept, you know, kept themselves quiet <laughs> in the forest. So it depends, you know, it depends on what, 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 um, what you want to do. Mm. You know, there were quite a few enlightened beings, but you never heard about them. Because they just kept quiet. Mm. But of course, you know, they, they gave, 
you know, what you call private teachings. There's, you know, one or two people. Mm. They didn't went, you know, they didn't go around. Mm. So it's really, um, yeah, doing what feels right. And use this intelligence, the intelligence, yeah. Mm. Okay? Yes. Yes. Of course. And as you know, in daily life, we need to think, don't we? But the only thing, we don't have to be thinking all the time. Because that's part of the, uh, the problem with humans. Even when we don't need to think, the mind keeps thinking, thinking, thinking. You know, it's like a machine that doesn't know when to stop. And that, that creates a lot of our delusions and our problems. And we waste a lot of mental energy also when we think too much. So what mindfulness does and wisdom, we bring order into the mind which means when we need to think, we think logically, rationally, and when we don't need to think, we come back to awareness. See the difference? And a good example, if I need to drink something, excuse me for a moment, I use a cup or a glass, and when I finish drinking, I put I put the, the cup down. You know, I don't carry the empty cup around with me. You put it down. That's order. That's intelligence. That's wisdom. Right? You, you use thinking when you need to think, and when you don't need to think, you come back to present moment awareness and knowing. And you begin to see that thinking should only be a tool to be used like the cup when drinking. It is not something that should be dominating our consciousness. But you know that most of the time, blah, 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 constantly. And that's why uh, the, the mindfulness practice is so beneficial. We learn to focus, you keep letting go, letting go. And the more we let go, the mind just becomes more light, more peaceful, more free, right? You unburden the mind of all this mental chatter because that is where the dukkha is, isn't it? Dukkha, thinking is dukkha. All the uh, kilesa, you know, all our mental defilements is created by thinking. Just like fear, worry, anxiety, frustration. It's all thinking. Mm. This was the first teaching I had from this man in India. He could speak a little English. He shook his head in the Indian style and he says, No thing, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> or you could modify that a little and you say, Less thinking, more mindfulness, less problem. See, it's like that. Mm, you have order, you have order. So does that answer your question, my friend? Yeah, it's about balance. Use thinking, but let it go. That's right. Yes, sir. Oh, I answered your question? Ah, okay. So that's a million ringgit. <laughs> yeah. Well, this subject is fascinating, you know, about what continues after death. It, it's always, it fascinates me, uh, and the unknown, and why we have the fear of the unknown. But it has to do with thinking. Mm. Yes, sir. Yeah, emotional intelligence is, is a part of wisdom and mindfulness. It means that, of course, if you cannot control your emotions, and most people can't, but the important thing is that when emotions arise, we don't identify with it. 
because that's a part of the dukkha. We're in a habit of identifying not only with the body, but with feelings and emotions. Hmm? Happy feeling arises, we say, I am happy. Perfectly normal. Unhappy feeling, I am unhappy. Hmm? Or I'm afraid, I'm upset, I'm bored, I'm lonely. You see that? It's a Just a moment. So when we identify with feelings and emotions, we hold on to them as something personal. And what the Dhamma is showing us is that these feelings and emotions don't really belong to us. They come and they go. So what the Buddha is saying with mindfulness, we learn how to objectify these emotions. Instead of saying, I am angry or am upset, there is anger, or there's a state of anger. There's a state of upset. There's a state of fear, not I am afraid. You see the difference? There's a very big difference. You see it as it is, without grasping at it with I, without taking it personally. Yes, I understand. I understand that. Mm. No, in cases like that, sometimes it is good to honk. Because you're, but you're making that person aware that they're making a mistake or you know, they're, they're, they're not driving correctly. But not keep honking and being angry. You, you see what, what I mean? You're honking out of something very practical. But of course, getting angry is only creating, you know, dukkha for yourself. But the point is, if if the anger arises, you breathe with it and you objectify it. There is anger, and you breathe, and it, and know it's Im it's impermanent. But I know with anger because it's such a strong, illogical emotion. Just sitting with anger is not easy. And that's why we have things like Qigong or yoga. Yeah. And ev actually a very simple thing you could do, and it's so simple, is this. You can do this anywhere. I show medical people this. Because, you know, they can't sit quietly in a hospital, right, when things are so busy. Well, they can just stop for one minute and just go. Because you find that when you breathe and move mindfully, it's an easy way to focus your mind, especially when you're in a very busy environment. And say if you're at the stoplight, you can do this because then you can both your hands are free. Or even if if one if you need one hand for staring, you can do it with the other hand. Just breathe. Of course, you have to keep your eyes open if you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're at a stoplight or you're parking, yeah, even for five minutes, it helps. It really helps just to breathe and move. It just brings you in the moment. It just brings you in the moment. Yeah. Well, this is wha one of the reasons why I do Qigong wherever I go. Because it's simple and it's just a very beneficial way of just dealing with, with, you know, stress. Any kind of stress, emotional stress, anxiety, depression. Yeah. Mm. Very simple. It's very simple. It's not complicated. And you know, it's a form of what we call dynamic mindfulness, right? You, you're moving with awareness, mm? just like mindful walking is a form of uh, dynamic mindfulness. Yeah. Mm. Or you can just do the laughing yoga. <laughs> just laugh. Mm. Mm. 
Like if somebody is being unpleasant to you, just do this and smile. And you ignore that person. And believe me, that person will be very puzzled. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> just, just ignore them. Because you see, really, the point is you don't react to that person's unpleasantness. Because it's your reaction that really causes dukkha. And that was one of the essential teachings of the Buddha. When you see, just see. When you hear, just hear. It sounds easy, but it's not easy to practice, right? Because we're so conditioned, right, from child, always reacting. This is nice, not nice. I like, I don't like. Like this. But when you practice this, you begin to see the, the great benefits of it, of not reacting. And in my own experience, I had over the two or three monks who got angry with me. Something very trivial. And I just kept calm. And, I no and you notice that when you keep calm, you act like a mirror hmm, where you reflect their anger or their behavior. You see that? Because you're not reacting. You just remain calm. So y you reflect their behavior. And this is good too with families. Because, you know, families no really know how to push your buttons, right? <laughs> If you just remain calm and smiling, and of course, you can do this. Just breathe. <laughs> and just ignore them. They say, wow, there's something wrong here. There's something funny, doing funny business. What are they doing? Because, <laughs> you know, they're, ex they're expecting you to get upset, right? But when you don't, wow, they see that there's something, you know, very unusual. Yes. Hmm. Actually, you can show children some of these movements, including the laughing, you know, the laughing Qigong. Mm. And I, I do the dynamic med meditation because it's, it's a good introduction for young people to mindfulness. It's called dynamic meditation. Do you know that the hand movements? Um, my video, just Bhante Covid, uh, one of the videos is called uh, Dynamic Meditation. Or if, if you type uh, Mahasati Meditation, you know Mahasati means great mindfulness. And you see a monk from Thailand doing the same thing on, on uh, YouTube. Mm. Mahasati, it's really good. Mm. Yeah, you're welcome. So it was very nice to uh, to be here and to share some uh, Sodama with you. And I hope uh, we we'll meet again. Oh yo, the fear of the future. <laughs>
So I wish you a good night. May you all be well, happy, and peaceful. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Do you like to have Bhante again? Uh, first of December, Sunday morning. Yeah, Bhante, Bhante just confirmed. Okay, good. So we see see you again on first of December, Monday, Sunday morning. And uh, another two, uh, one short announcement. This Saturday uh, evening, we are having uh, the launch of Jam Kids, uh, iGems uh, third album. iGems, our our singing group in BGF. Is uh, having an album launch in a, in a level two at seven thirty, and also Sunday morning we have a CPR, blood, cardiac, uh, CPR. Uh, this <coughs> uh, Sunday morning at nine o'clock here. Okay, thank you. So uh, BJ would like to offer a short, small uh, bante. On, on behalf of BJ, I'd like to offer a small. So, uh, can we give three bows to Bunty? Sadhu, sadhu. Please help to keep the cushions. Uh, Bante is having uh, meditation retreats, uh, four retreats, four one-day retreats every Saturday, starting from this Saturday at Brickfield Temple. Oh, sorry. Last Saturday is only half a day, and it's going to be at Lake Garden. Ah, so yeah. three in Brickfields, one in Lake Garden. That's right. This Saturday. This Saturday, from nine to six, nine a.m. to six. And your topic on the first is also mindfulness and qigong. That's right. Mind, mind, 